Season 1 of Off the Dribble, the Byron Scott Podcast is brought to you by Neff Paco. Well, hello there. It's just me and the world's best tasting vodka. What's up, guys? This is uh, Off the Dribble with your boy Byron Scott. I am here with one of my closest friends. I'm not going to even say his name yet because once I start going through some of these accolades and some of the things that this man has done in his coll- collegiate coll- career and his professional career, you might have a, uh, a sense of who it might be. So I'm going I'm to just rattle it. He got so many accolades, I can't just go off the top of my head. I got to read him on a piece of paper because he, he's done so much. So six-time Pro Bowler. Okay, that, that, that's the first thing we're going to talk about. So we're talking about the NFL. He is a, a collegiate Hall of Famer, a NFL Hall of Famer, Heisman Trophy winner, uh, a Super Bowl champion. Matter of fact, he is the only player that has uh, won a Super Bowl and been named NFL MVP and a Super Bowl MVP. He, uh, he also left one unbelievable organization and went to another organization where he got comeback player of the year when he left the other organization uh in high school the man was a quarterback now i know a lot of you guys when you hear his name you're not gonna know that you're gonna be like what you know this man was a quarterback in high school and i want to ask him this question before i'm gonna ask him this question i should say but my my special guest today is my main man marcus allen pro what's going (laughs) on What's up, Byron, man? Good to be with you, man. Man, it's good to see you, man. Now, as, as, I, as I'm, you know, rattling all off them, you know, the, the, the accolades that you've had over your unbelievable career from college to the, to the NFL to, you know, to Canton, you know, which is the Hall of Fame. Uh, I, I want to go back to, to high school. One, one quick question I have about high school. You played quarterback in, in high school, correct? Yes. And you purposely fumbled the ball <laughs> in a game. <laughs> Tell us about that. Tell us about that, bro. Oh, no, 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 no. Actually, what happened, Byron, was uh, I was a um, I was a defensive back. I love hitting people. I oh, still, okay. Uh, Jack Tatum, I used to. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Like George Atkinson and stuff like that. And so I grew up, that was my first position. And when I started playing football, I was a cornerback, really, at, at the age of 10. And I, uh, I you know, I'm I called myself Lim Barney. That's the guy who I sort of uh, you know, admired and patterned myself after and stuff as a young little uh, pop runner player. Uh, as I got older, um, I moved to safety um, and played linebacker in high school. But one day uh, the coach came to me and this was at practice. And he said, Marcus, listen here, you're the best athlete on the team and we need you to play quarterback. And I really didn't want to, because again, I was just, all about, you know, intimidating people, hitting people, you know, uh, showing my physicality and stuff like that. And and so I reluctantly went on the center, right, and I fumbled the ball eight times in a row. <laughs> Did you say eight? <laughs> On purpose. Did you say yes, eight? eight <laughs> yeah. Not once, not twice, not once, but twice, eight yeah. times in a row. Times, yeah. And I... Um, the coach knew what I did, and he said, "Get out! Get off the field! Get out of here! You're off the team!" <laughs> oh, so, so wait a minute, wait a minute. He he told you get off the team. Yeah, he kicked me off the team. Kick, yeah, he kicked me out of practice and kicked me off the team. Wow! And so I was like, "Are you kidding me? I'm the best player you have. What are you talking about? You're gonna kick me off the team?" So uh, when I when I you know um, I went into the locker room and I took a shower and I and, and I and I went home and I remember telling my dad. I said, Dad, uh, Coach Player kicked me off the team. Could you believe that? I mean, just because I didn't want to play quarterback. And he said, well, that's between you two. Oh, okay. Okay. So instead of, you know, like, you know, most parents do, right. you know, they, you know, obviously want to handle the situation, you know, he said, listen, you resolve it yourself. And so, I mean, I, with that, from that point, I, just, I, I start learning how to troubleshoot, you know, for myself, do things for myself and not necessarily depend on my parents for everything, you know, and that, right. that, that was a huge lesson. And so I actually had to go back and apologize. And then I was reinstated to the team and I did play quarterback in Byron as, as things, um, you know, uh, as fate would have it, I end up, uh, you know, going to USC, getting, getting recruited as a defensive back there. But because I played quarterback, 
And uh, I was successful at that position. And I ran the ball Mm -hmm. when all the running backs at USC were hurt. They needed somebody to come and play running back. And guess who they asked? Wow. They asked me. And that was all because (laughs) I played quarterback in high school and I ran the ball and I finally came back and I listened to the coach. And uh, those are the things that, you know, we, we sort of look back and reflect and say, you know what? A lot of times, and this is so important for all of us, right? Because we have blind spots in life, right? right and we need right, people, right? whether it's good friends or a coach that points out something that we don't see in ourselves. Mm-hmm. And I certainly didn't see that part of myself, mm-hmm. but it certainly helped me later on, right? Again, I mean, how lucky and fortunate can a guy get? I go to USC, which is tailback you at the time. Right. I'm on the defensive back. All the running backs get hurt. They have nobody to practice behind Charles White. And guess who they asked to come over? And that was because they saw me play quarterback and run the ball in high school. Wow. Great story. I, I love the fact that your dad, though, said, you know what? You, you That's between you and the coach. You know, in yeah. other words, you a man. Go take care of it yourself. I'm not going to intervene. You know, this is something that you uh, that you made happen. So, you go resolve it. I, I love that lesson. Well, it was a great lesson, but it kind of backfired on it too because I, <laughs> I didn't go to him for much. Although I love, I loved him for everything that he done. I start doing things on my own. Right. <laughs> That's the part they raised you to be independent. Right. And then when you are independent, it's like, <laughs> that creates some challenges, right? So I said, "Come on, Dad, I got this handled." Now. I, you know, <laughs> I didn't mean, you know, you to handle everything. Right, right, <laughs> right. Well, That's listen, I, <laughs> listen. I, I've gotten the chance to meet Mr. and Mrs. Allen, two of the most unbelievable people I've ever met. I mean, your parents, I mean, your yeah. mom especially, man. Your mom is, every time yeah. I see her, it's like my mom, you know, and, you know, <laughs> and she she knows she can call me and I'll do anything for her. You know, she she can call me on your behalf, you can call, whatever. She know I'm going to drop everything to come and do what, what, whatever she need me to do. I'm like, Mrs. Allen, whatever you need, I, I'm there. I mean, your mom is special. My, thank you. I, I appreciate that. And she feels certainly, you know, that you're special to her. And she treats you like, you know, you're her own. <laughs> and I love that. But it's something, you know, I was I was thinking about the other day, right? I had my golf tournament when you you were there. Yeah, yeah. And my mother was, uh, she hadn't seen Ahmad Rashad in a long time. And she was like, oh my God, Ahmad Rashad. I, haven't, I was like, I forgot my mother is a huge man, sports fan. Man. I mean, she knows about every, I mean, all these guys, uh, you know, accolades and, and everything that they've done and stuff. So it's not just some sort of, you know, it's like some sort of passing thing. I mean, she is like, my mother is like, she knows like stats and <laughs> she knows details and she knows everything, man. And so I got to, I got to chuckle out of that. I was just like, <laughs> I, I forget that you just, you know, it's like, my mom, she loves sports, so she follows a lot of guys. And then when she gets the opportunity to meet them, it's like, I mean, she doesn't hold back. Which no, is cool. no, she's so cool. But the, the <laughs> great thing about your your golf tournaments is you have all these unbelievable athletes there. We all get a chance to be in a room, especially after golf, and and, and kind of congregate and, and have a good time of talking to one another. But it's unbelievable when your mom walks in the room. Everybody stops and, and stands up and give her a, a, a standing ovation. That's how popular she is. She she is amazing, though. I, I mean, I love and look forward to seeing her every year when I'm in your golf tournament. Listen here, man. You, you, this is this is the thing that we we certainly have to think and reflect on, right? It's like you talk about the grace of God, right? Yes, yes. I didn't ask for great parents. No, you just got right? lucky and got great parents. That's what I'm saying. It's like by the grace of God, I didn't ask for great siblings, right? right? I didn't ask for I didn't ask for talent. I didn't ask for a good head on my shoulder. I didn't ask for any of those things. Dude. So to me, it's always like it's easy to live with such gratitude because I'm going like, why was I so lucky to have great parents? I mean, it's evident uh, with you know with with you and the relationship that you have, and you and also that you see her have with everybody else. It's mm-hmm. like. Dude, how did I get so lucky? Yeah. Man? My mother's she, my mother's awesome. My mother's <laughs> awesome. And I'm going like, you know, I didn't ask for any of that stuff. We're just born. Right, right. And we come to the world and whoever we're, you know, um, you know, I, I guess assigned to be with, you know what I mean? It is because it's all planned out. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. and it's like that's the, that's what is, is kind of, you know, 
awe inspiring, man. It's like, wow, man, I got really lucky. My mom and my dad, and I'll tell you a story about my dad. Uh, later, because they you know we 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 discuss something that we're going to discuss <laughs> later. <with that. laughs> uh, you know, I can't so. wait to hear that either, because I love your dad, man. He, your dad, the thing that's so cool, and, and I know I, I know we 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 just going on about how great your your, your family is because they are first of all. But your dad is about the coolest dude. I mean, your mom, you know, your mom comes in and, and she's like Queen Elizabeth. She walk in and she's like this and everybody's standing, giving her ovation. And your dad just kind of sneaks in and takes a seat and just chills. And it's, and it's just so cool that I've been able to witness this over the years uh, of being around you and playing in your golf tournament. But we'll, we'll go back to dad in a little while. But I, right. I want also the people to understand this. You know, when you went to SC, even though you were highly re- recruited, they were like you said, it was tailback you. And I remember it, it might have been your junior year where basically you were playing fullback and Charles White was the featured tailback. And yeah. if I'm not mistaken, Charles ends up winning the Heisman. Your senior year, you moved from that position, which was that, that fullback blocking back to tailback <laughs> and go crazy. And then you win the Heisman. Well, no, no, just you just uh, my sophomore year, actually. OK, OK. And this is what happened. My sophomore year, uh, I, I played sparingly my freshman year. Right. My my whole, you know, when I went to USC, my, my thought was, was I'm going to be in the secondary with Ronnie Lott and Dennis Smith, guys that you know, right? We <laughs> were well. yeah. secondary around. It didn't work out that way. Right. Which, you know, which <laughs> which I'm happy, you know. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy that he did because what happened was obviously perfect. But, um, you know, I, was, I, I wasn't I was going to play behind uh, Charlie. You know, he was obviously the uh, Heisman Trophy contender, mm-hmm. one of the best players in the country, and I wasn't going to play. And so John Robinson said, hey, Marcus, listen there, why don't you um, why don't you think about playing fullback? Because, uh, honestly, you're too good an athlete to sit on the bench. And I just said, sure. And, and what happened was, I mean, it was probably one of the best decisions I ever made. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, it was the most one of the most challenging because physically I was not um, um, a, a, an intimidating factor. I was only like weighing 185 or something like that. And I later ended up going against linebackers that were weighing, you know, like, uh, you know, 250, 245 guys were much bigger then. So, I mean, I had to uh, had to use my head and. Um, and and not try to use my physicality every single time because I wouldn't last. Yeah, yeah. You know? uh, so I had to be smart, and you know the old saying that familiarity breeds contempt, right? So you got to change things up. You can't do the same thing all the time, right? So I was smart enough to keep guys off balance, and um, and it was just a, a great experience for me to learn how to you know pass block to run routes. Um, but I was a lead blocker. To I mean, in goal line, short yardage situations. I mean, I was I was right in the mix, and it was great because I, you know, uh, the more I played, the 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 uh, more confident I got in myself uh, because it was a new position for me. Mm-hmm. I mean, anytime you sort of conquer something new, right? Was not, and that was not something that I was even thinking about because I, I knew I was undersized, mm-hmm. and I knew there was going to be a challenge, but I accepted the challenge, and that um, I think that certainly made me. Um, the overall player that I, you know, turned out to be uh, later in, in, in the pros. Yeah. And then you um, you win the Heisman, like I said earlier. You get drafted by well, the Raiders. Can I, can I interrupt you for one second? Yeah, of course. Ryan, I, they, they, put me in, they put me in my junior year, all right? And what happened was, and, and not very many people know this, this is my first time actually playing running back okay. since I was 11 years old. Right. I played one time and I actually scored 30 something touchdowns uh, when I was 11 years old, but I never <laughs> went back to that position. I always played defense. Right. So um, it was a learning experience for me. And, 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 and when you understand the, um, you know, what it takes to be a USC running back, right? You had to be tough. You had to be physical. You had to, had to have endurance. And that's all I ever thought about was just sort of, you know, physically standing up to the task of it, right? Right. So I had to learn, I learned a lot my junior year, but it was, uh, I did not, even though I gained 1,500 yards, um, there were still opportunities that I didn't take advantage of because I I really wasn't thinking about breaking the long run. Mm -hmm, I was thinking mm -hmm. about just being physical, Mm -hmm. right? Oh, okay, got you, got you. And so there were some, some, you know, some, 
I, I, for the first time in my career, I heard spatters of booze or doubt uh, among the, the fan base that I, I may not be the guy. Mm-hmm. And so they were, you know, what happens is, is when you, you know, you, you run the ball, you know, all the way downfield, you gain three yards in a cloud of dust, and then somebody comes in and breaks a long one, and they say, that's the guy should, that should be playing. Well, that was only my first year playing running back. Right. And what they didn't understand was, I mean, I really didn't know what I was doing. Um, and so I dedicated my, my off season to actually the intellectual part of the game, right? Mm-hmm. Actually knowing every facet of the game, knowing what everybody was doing on every single play, and then knowing what the defenses were doing. And so I, I always say this, there's two types of players, and you know this, those who know, and those who don't. <laughs> right, right. And the guys who know the most go the furthest, yes, right? Yes, yes. And so I came back my junior year um, and remembering the little doubt that people had about me, but not understanding that was only my first year ever playing running back. I came back with the ultimate confidence because I knew everything. And then I also knew um, my confidence level was so high, right? And so my senior year was different. I was trying, I was trying to break everything. Right, right. <laughs> well, not, not everything. It was, you know, a short yardage situation. I'm always trying to move the change and right. stuff like that. If a big run happens, it happens, right? But I was I was trying to go to distance on, you know, every time I touched it. Uh and and what ended up happening was I was the first running back in uh, in, in NCAA history to gain two thousand yard rushing. And um so, I mean, when I go from not knowing how to play to one year to understanding the game, as well as being physically and mentally prepared to have the best year you can possibly have, um, because, it, you know, I had always worked towards that, but then I had the intellectual part. I, mean, I didn't think there was anything that was going to stop me. Right. It's amazing that you said your junior year, you go for 1,500 yards and you didn't really know what you was doing. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then your senior year, you go over 2,000, you know, first player in NCAA history ever run for 2,000 yards in a season and you don't have 14, 16 games like NFL. You know what I mean? So right. to do that was an amazing feat. Win the Heisman that year, right? You get drafted by the Raiders, the 10th pick, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. And then you go to the Raiders and – you know, I, I mean, you know, pro, I, I watched you for so many years. The one thing I used to always say is that it, it seemed like every time you ran the ball, nobody got a clean hit. Nobody could ever catch you clean. It, you were so shifty. And, you know, like you just said a little while ago, you knew everything about everybody on that defensive end. So you knew which guys was, you know, how, how they were going to try to attack you. And you were all you would never give them angles where they could get you, you know, like dead square. You were just one of the most shiftiest <laughs> running backs I've ever seen, you know, and well, I, I, what do you contribute that to? Was. And part of that was playing defense and having a defensive mentality too. Okay. Right? And one that was aggressive. So uh, I like to think if I ever had trouble with anybody, it was those guys who were just fundamentally sound. Right. Okay. You know, gotcha. <laughs> who, gotcha. Who would have break down and do the proper tactic. I like those guys that were so aggressive. They would take a shot at you. Right. And they were so <laughs> easy to make miss. Right. But, um, after my, my after my senior year, obviously, you know, winning the Heisman Trophy, you know you come in with a target on your back, right, right? Right, And I remember going into camp not saying one word. Not one word, dude. I worked my butt off. Obviously, they saw how hard I worked. And I remember that um, uh, Matt Millen and I got into some sort of confrontation and stuff. And, and he thought I did it on purpose and stuff. And this is really, it's interesting how because uh, he went to Penn State and I went to USC and they played in the Fiesta Bowl <laughs> that he took that, you know, that experience of that game personally into, you know. So he was still holding that against you. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 uh, into practice, right? I guess in one of the <laughs> challenge me and stuff and we had some sort of altercation and stuff like that and I just got up and went back about my business and and I remember and I don't, and I'm going to ask you this question because this is important too. Because I mean, there's always like one guy, right? Right, right. That, that sort of gives you confirmation, right? And so, my rookie season, I remember um, 
I, I got in this habit, right? We were in the huddle, and, and when they called timeout, I started to walk over with Jim Plunkett, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to listen to the conversation. Right. And so there on the sidelines, he, Tom Flores, and a bunch of other coaches, and, 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 and Plunkett, and I'm listening in, and they don't know what to call. And all of a sudden, you hear this voice, man, this deep voice on the sidelines from this six, seven, uh, <laughs> Ted Hendricks. Just get a ball, just get a ball to Marcus, <laughs> dude. That was it, right there, dude. That was Ted it. Hendricks, man, who I grew up watching on TV, right? The start. Just get a ball to Marcus. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. That was like you know. And so I want to ask you that question, man. At one point, I knew it was somebody who was saying, man. Hey, Hey, just say, hey, just, just throw it out the bar and he'll hit it. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, you know who that was for me, pro? That that was uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Yeah. You I'm know, I mean, you. the captain was uh, was amazing because, you know, every time he touched the ball, somebody got to double team him. Right. Because you know, they, they, there's nothing you could do with him. And I, yeah. I remember him getting double teamed. And this is probably my second year. You know, my, my first year, Cap didn't talk much to anybody, you know. But my second <laughs> year, I'm sitting next to him, you know, in the locker room, end up being six years. But my second year, he started to talk to me, you know. And all of a sudden, we became fr- really good friends. Right. And ball was thrown into the post to him. I went to the corner. My man left me to go double. Right. And Kareem throws it out to the corner. And he said, B, get him out that zone. And I knocked out. <laughs> I come up, boom, <laughs> knock down the shot for a three. And he was like, that's right, B. Don't let him sit in no zone. That right there was like, okay, I'm good. I, I, I made it. I'm all right. You know, no, that was my confirmation. Amazing? There you go. We, we we have confidence in ourselves. And and, and I guess when we're, you're new, right, because you want the approval of your teammates. Absolutely. Right? And Absolutely. you're going from college to the pros, right? It's a different thing. And so you, you know, although the because they're always kind of like checking you out to see if legitimate, right, or right. Is he, is he advertised? Is he, you know, is he is he just a uh, is he a, uh, a media creation? Right, you know right. what I mean? So they're kind of like observing <laughs> and stuff like that. And this is how they test us, yeah, right? absolutely. So, and then you actually, you know, you come through for them. And that was the one thing I said, man. Ted Hendricks said, "Give it to me." And I said, "Oh man, this is." I'm, I'm good to go now. Man. I got to get sure busy now. Yeah, I sure did. I said the same thing. You you speak a little bit about Tom Flores, you know, and he was yeah. coaching the Raiders. Tell us a little bit about your relationship with, with, with Coach Flores. It seemed to be a great I got, relationship. I Dude, I cried, actually. I called him up when he finally got the, uh, the, um, the honor, you know, um, and I cried. And uh, it, it, you know what happens? It, in a, it's almost similar to the story with, with, with Hendrix and stuff. When you, when you get a coach, right, and Tom was my um, my coach at the Olympic Gold Bowl, which was the first and only time they had it in San Diego. Mm, okay. right? They didn't have it after that and stuff. And he was my coach. And I noticed, uh, you know, I noticed, you know, sort of, you know, evaluating my talent and things like that and stuff. And I remember them throwing me a pass. It was a, uh, a down and up, out and up out of the backfield and I dove and caught it. And I think that was really sort of the play that sealed it for me. And I think he was one of the reasons that they, uh, they drafted me, uh, mm. but he, he really switched the, the, you know, he, he went to an eye formation and they had never been in an eye formation. They've always been a far left, far right team mm-hmm. or split backfield. And so, you know, so he, he, he set the stage for me. I mean, and he had the ultimate trust in me right away. Mm-hmm. And, um, he, you know, he gave me the starting role from, you know, not from day one, um, but obviously he saw that I could play. And then, you know, uh, at the start of my career, it was like, you know, I had the greatest support from, from a guy that was just as, as, as mild mind manner and yet strong and supportive and, and um, was just, you know, just extremely knowledgeable, knew how to push all the right buttons, uh, knew when to let up, knew when to push, knew when to just, you know, he was just the, just a great coach. Mm-hmm. And uh, and he treated us all like men. Yeah. And that was the thing that was um, that I love about Tom. I mean, he, he, you know, he changed things for me. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I, and he knows that I, you know, I worked hard for him. I mean, he's one of those guys I'd run through a wall for. It, so, yeah. so. It, it's funny because you, you, when you're describing Tom, it, it sounds so much like Pat Riley. You know what I'm saying? I mean, just that, yeah. that you know, his demeanor on the sideline of just being calm, cool, and collective. But, you know, deep down inside, you know, he's got that fiery, 
personality. Oh, he knows how to push all the right buttons. And he, he demands, you know, respect, you know, when he's on that sideline. Uh, yeah. just, you, you just brought back a lot of memories when you start talking about Coach Flores because I, I, I a lot of that sounds just like Coach Pat Riley. Byron, when games were on the line, I looked over at the sideline. Man, I never saw a moment of panic yeah. ever. Yeah. Dude, he was always under control. It was always as though, don't worry, we're going to win this game. And when your head coach is like that, dude, I mean, it, you had we had like several captains on the field, guys right. that were, you know, just great, great players who I learned from and stuff. But, I mean, when you got that many players in the field that, you know, that uh, feel the same way and you got a head coach that doesn't panic and always look like he's got ice water in his vein, dude, I mean, it's like – I mean, you can you can win every game out there. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Uh, Pro, I want to ask you about this incident. Now, I, I, you know, you were going to a Super Bowl. You know, you were you were playing in the Super Bowl, and you had to rent a car, <laughs> <laughs> and you driving to the stadium. Tell us, <laughs> I, I, I'm gonna let you finish this. I, I didn't already set the stage. <laughs> you know, you rented a car, you and another player, <laughs> and you're driving to a Super Bowl game. <laughs> yeah, right. Now you, you go ahead and finish it from here. Today's episode of Off the Dribble, the Byron Scott podcast, is brought to you by Mission Muay Thai. Mission is an authentic Muay Thai training facility in Long Beach, California, focusing on traditional Muay Thai arts for professional combat sports, self defense, and fitness for youth and adults. Take advantage of the $10 intro class promo by registering on the website or download Mission Muay Thai app. Visit MissionMuayThai.com for more information. Well, first of all, let, let me just back up just a little bit. First night, I had the greatest night's sleep that you can buy. <laughs> I had so you were ready. ready. Yeah, yes, I was ready to go. And, and what was really strange was everything was like no big deal to me. I just kind of smiled at everything, right? So I remember going to um, you know, breakfast that morning and, uh, you know, having our usual, you know, dish, you know, either steak and eggs at that time. That mm -hmm. was sort of the nutrition then, right? But <laughs> I remember those days. Yeah. And and then we had a team meeting and, and after that, you know, um, um and they supplied us with cars throughout the week, right? Okay. So I thought, you know, I didn't know any better. I just thought that we could, you know, um, uh, you know, normally the, you, there's a bus, right. an early bus <laughs> right. road, and then there's a later bus, right? And so most guys would either catch the early bus and catch it later. And some guys who wanted to go really early would normally catch a cab to the game, mm -hmm. right? We're talking about cabs now, not Ubers. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> this is how long we've been this way, right? So what happened was is that um, Otis McKinney and I, I jumped in the car and we, we pulled up to the uh, parking attendant and we say, excuse me, man, which uh, we play for the Raiders uh, and, uh, you know, we just want to go, where's the players park? And I said, she says, uh, well, um, do you have a parking pass? And I said, no. She says, well, you can't get in if you don't have a parking pass. <laughs> and I said, no, no, excuse me. I'm not joking. This is serious. We're playing in today's game, and uh, we need to get in. She says, listen here. If you don't have a parking pass, you don't get in the game. So and I'm going like, She don't know who you guys are? No, she doesn't. <laughs> and she probably didn't care either, did she? I was, yeah, I was still early in my career. That's, that's what I'll, I'll leave it at that. So I look at Otis. He looks at me. We back the car up, right, against the curb. He grabs his bag. I grab my bag. And we take off running to the locker room. And we leave that rental car there. And to this day, I don't know what happened to it. <laughs> so you never went back after the game no. to see if the car, you got on the bus. No. <laughs> oh, yeah, I did. I've got it on the bus. You're absolutely right. I mean, uh, listen, I wasn't thinking about that car. I right, was right. Just about but as we were going in, I mean, that's not something I thought about. And then I go years later, you go like, man, if you would leave a car outside the stadium now, oh, they would shut down the entire game. Oh, stuff, absolutely. Right? Yeah, absolutely. That was, uh, yeah, that, was <laughs> that must have been fun, though. That must have been a hell of a memory right there when you probably – after celebrating and everything, you get to the room, I don't know, maybe the next day you say, you know what, what happened to that damn car? <laughs> Wait, what, is it still there? You know, where's that car Somebody at? Somebody had it in, or the Raiders had a long, uh, yeah, a pretty large bill. Maybe that's why they were upset. I don't know. <laughs> oh, so. that's funny, bro. That's funny. Listen, you also played with two other great running backs. You know, I, yeah. I'm sure you played with some other ones that you would consider great as well, but... You know, Eric Dickerson, 
you know, who I watched when he was with the Rams, when he came out of, you know, SMU. And I was like, just, I, I loved ED, you know, I mean, yeah. it's, it's funny how I, I, I loved ED. You know, obviously I loved you, you know, watching you guys run. You know, I was a big Marshall Falk fan when he came out, love the Damian Thomas, you know, I, I go way right. back to the Franco Harris, you know, I, I mean, I had, I just got a, an infinity for running backs for for some yeah, reason. I, was I, say, yeah. you back at some I, I don't know what it is about running backs, but and it seems that I, I got so many of y'all that's my boys too. I play you know golf with Ed every now and then, you know, so it's, it's so cool. So Ed and Bo Jackson, yeah, you know, I, you guys all you know you on the team with those guys. What the, what was the competition like in practice then? You know, when you, when you had guys like that, well, there wasn't much competition because. <laughs> Because I wasn't allowed to practice very much. <laughs> you know, I was I was sort of a, I, guess, I, I I don't know what you want to call it, but I was um, I was I, I don't I don't know I don't even know why I was there. You know, I, I, prior, prior to that, the situation wasn't working out, and I asked to be. You know, I would go into his office and. I very eloquently asked him to, you know, either cut me or betray me or do whatever. <laughs> and then weeks later, he would come back and say, nobody wants you, right? So, <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. oh, wow. So, okay. But he would never release me, but then he would bring all these guys in, and then they would come in, uh, but they wouldn't let me come to training camp either, right? Oh, wow. So, yeah, they would always... Byron, at that particular time, there was a, I signed a series of one-year contracts because uh, we didn't have union representation and stuff like that. And so I uh, didn't have much protection from a, from a legal standpoint as far as the legal was concerned. And so, because I was one of the guys who eventually sued uh, the National Football League for free agency. Mm. Me, Reggie White, I think it was Mark Collins and uh, Freeman McNeil mm -hmm. for the name plaintiff that changed the system forever. But prior to that, we didn't have any any protection. So either you had to play for that team or you didn't play at all. Right. So I, you know, I had to, um, I had to deal with that. Um, and, and yet there wasn't much competition. Um, but the one thing I never let it, um, get in the way of developing, uh, friendships or being a great teammate. Right. Right. Uh, when it came to Bo Jackson and Eric will tell you this as well. Um, this is why Eric and I are really tight. Right. Um, when it came to Bo or Eric, any information, you know, that they needed, I never held back from mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because one, I never wanted our team to suffer. Right. If they were asked to go in and didn't know what to do and it'd be said that Marcus did not, you know, he held back. Well, he didn't tell me that. No, I told him everything. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And to this day, that's why there's a, the, you know, respect and friendship that we have, because even though the situation was an idea, it was not something uh, regarding the players. It was me and management. It was me and it was never the players. And that's why we have our friendship today. That's why when I did live in L.A., Eric and I were, was golfing all the time. Yeah, yeah. We were <laughs> golfing like every other day, you know what I mean? So, um, but two physical specimens. I mean, you you go back and, you know, Eric could have easily won the Heisman Trophy. You know, Bo and I won it, but Eric could have won it. And he was playing part-time at SMU. Right. right? Right. And we know what he did when he went to uh, uh, the Rams uh, in Orange County. And, and, and so, I mean, just phenomenal numbers. You can't, you know, you, you, you can't even say anything negative about it. I mean, it's just nothing but positive when it comes, you know, his, his style. I mean, the way he ran the ball, everything right. about it was just, it was, it was graceful, it was powerful, and Bo was powerful and speedy and stuff. And, and, um, you know, it was it was it was a challenging time, but uh, you know, I always felt like, hey, you know, when you given the opportunity, and that's why you know, after I ended up leaving there, um, when I sued the league, that was my only recourse. Mm -hmm. That's the only reason I left. They would have probably held me there forever, right? In a secondary role, because I remember coming into camp and and, and I was in. Um, uh, in fourth fourth position, I was like I, I was like the number four running back in camp one time, dude. So wow, was, that, that, that's that's yeah. that is mind boggling to me. That's crazy. There's there's no way yeah. in hell you're gonna be on the, yeah. <laughs> I was on the death chart four. as four. There's yeah. I I just don't see it, pro. I, I don't see it. Um, oh, Byron, there was one game, uh, uh, and this was a preseason game, and, and you probably know this, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, even common sense would sort of reflect this, though. 
uh, when you uh, <clears throat> the starters normally play one series that right. they play it off already. Right? right, right. And then the, the second guy, uh, you know, uh, maybe second string guy come in and he'll finish the first quarter. And then the third quarter guy, <laughs> maybe there's two guys and they split the third. You know, normally if you're in the last quarter, you're not going to make the team, right? <laughs> well, it was one game they told me, right? <laughs> they were, uh, I had come into camp late. And this was over in London. I remember going there. We came into camp late. Oh, I had came into camp late. They wouldn't let me come into camp. I came in. It was like two weeks later, but it was almost the same time we were going to London. And I remember um, I was going against uh, the New Orleans Saints in practice before we played them in the uh, in the preseason game there. And I was going against Pat Swilling and Reggie, uh, Reggie uh, not Reggie Jackson, uh, Ricky Jackson. Mm-hmm. And and, um, dude, I mean, I was getting killed, dude, because <laughs> I, mean, I didn't have anybody blocking for me. I mean, normally if you're four string, right, you right. <laughs> so I, um, it was tough. And then we, um, we, 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 <laughs> we, uh, we, we got through practice and then we, you know, it was game time and stuff like that. So I'm, you know, I'm all, you know, I'm, got my uniform on and stuff and I'm ready to go play the game and stuff like that. Art Shell is telling everybody when they're going to go in. And he says, Marcus, you're going in the fourth quarter. I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> I politely said, no, I'm not. <laughs> so, so you didn't go in at all? No, I didn't go in. No. Oh, wow. That, that's, that's crazy. That's crazy. So, no, I, I wouldn't go. I didn't, I didn't do that. But I, I ain't mad at you, bro. I ain't mad at you at all. <laughs> uh, I, I want to go back a little bit because you still have one of the most historical runs in Super Bowl history. You know, you, you go you know, to the right, and all of a sudden you reverse your field. And I think you was going right. Or was you going? I think you were going to the right. You reverse your field. You run it up, you know, for a 74 yard touchdown against the Washington Redskins, win Super Bowl. You get Super Bowl MVP. Uh, is that, and to me, because I, you know, I saw, I saw a lot of runs by you, a lot of touchdowns. That might have been the best run I've ever seen by you. And, and quite frankly, by almost any running back I've ever seen, period. At that stage, on, on that stage, you know, Super Bowl, you know, in, in 74 yards, is that still one of the best runs you've ever had? Well, I, it's clear when you, you think about the circumstances and right. you think about the game, magnitude of the game, yes. Um, and it's, it's interesting, you know, um, it, it, I have to go back again. I, when I said I had the best night's sleep I ever had, Wow. You know, I don't know if it was like rim 10 or whatever, wow. but I mean, I slept so feasibly when I actually got through the stadium after, um, uh, you know, abandoning the car in the parking lot. <laughs> I remember just getting into the locker room and everybody was, you know, the, the usual thing. Guys used playing cards. Some guys were smoking cigarettes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Some guys were uh, listening to music. And I was just kind of smiling, taking everything in. But I, but I felt like my feet never touched the ground. Wow. Uh, and even, even during uh, player introductions, um, my feet never touched the ground. And I think it wasn't my first carry, but it was pretty close to my first carry. I remember fumbling the ball. And um, um, Frank Hawkins, my fullback, recovered it. But I remember um, the ball just kind of you know, slowly rolling away. It was in slow motion too. And I can just see, you know, Roselle, Pete Roselle kind of just, you know, the, you know, the, <laughs> the names and the, the threads and stuff, just slowly rolling away. Every single detail was just hype, you know, and, and Frank jumped on it and I just walked back to the huddle. Like it was no big deal. Now, honestly, you know, most people were just like completely panicked. They just followed the ball right uh, in the Super Bowl. It's like, I was like, <laughs> it didn't bother me. Nothing bothered me that game. And I just felt like it was a matter of time. And, and then it just happened. Uh, and I was actually running left, running left yeah. play, off the left-hand side. And I reversed uh, field. Uh, Ken Coffey, the, uh, the safety, almost got the ball out of my hand. But when I reversed, um, finally turned up field, rather. Uh, I mean, I was, I was shot out of a cannon. Um, I mean, I accelerated. Yeah. You know, I remember. People said, yeah, not that bad. I remember that, but like uh, competitively, I was always, you know, I was, I was, I was fast. Yeah. I was, uh, and I was quick that game too. I was super quick, and 
I felt light on my feet. And I really felt like, you know, they, I think it was, um, well, it's not John Vicinda, but it's the other gentleman, uh, the great narrator. I think he said nothing on earth that could run black and run block and tackle could stop the Raiders on black Sunday. And I felt like he was really talking about me. Yeah. Yeah. Still one of the best runs I've ever seen pro. Um, I know this might be a little bit of a touchy subject, but I got to ask you, do you the, the relationship with Al Davis, you know, yeah. how, how did that end and where is it today? Today? Well, I obviously it did not end well. Uh, and, and it's unfortunate um, because I, you know, I'm not one of those types that like to, you know, those things to linger, yeah. you know, and uh, I try to put those things behind me because there's no way to live to, you know, have, carrying around luggage like that or baggage like that, right. or, a bunch of negativity. Right. Right. And so I'm all about trying to, uh, you know, you know, move forward and stuff. But my relationship today with the Raiders is great. Uh, Mark Davis asked me, uh, it was a couple of years ago, uh, I think it was a year before their last year in, um, in Oakland to light the torch for Isle. Mm. And that, that was my way of saying, Hey, this is all the past. Yeah. And this is now the future and stuff, you know, once a Raider, always a Raider and stuff. And, and Mark has been fantastic. And uh, he and I talked often. Um, uh, we have a great relationship. Um, I'm very supportive of the organization. Mm. I've always been yeah. I mean, contrary yeah. to what people think, you know what I mean? I think, I get people, you know, maybe at an autograph show and they said, well, I know you don't want to sign this. I'm going, I don't mind. (laughs) Just because I had, you know, a situation with one person does not color, you know, an entire organization negative for me. Right. Um, I always love the people there. I love my teammates there. And uh, and I actually try to honor them, uh, not only in Kansas City, but in the Raiders as well. Yeah. So, but it's it's a good relationship now. Um, It's unfortunate that it happened. But it's part of my growth um, because, you know, when you have something taken away from you that you love, um, how do you respond to it? Right. How do you, right. you know, how do you deal with adversity? How do you, do you quit? Uh, do you, you know, do you allow someone to force you to quit? Uh, how strong are you? You know, and so um, I knew that uh, I had you know, tons of resolve. And mm-hmm. I knew that, you know, once legally that I got out of there, all I wanted to do was go someplace and have um, the ability to play football and that that ability would um, would show itself. Yeah. And that everybody would see that, you know, whatever negativity uh, or whatever was said negative um, <clears throat> wasn't the case. I'm going to turn it into a positive and show you the real uh, situation and stuff. And so that's what I did when I, you know, I, I led the league and I think scoring touch uh, scoring, uh, or at least AFC in and, 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 and touchdowns and with, with 15. Yeah. After it was said that I was washed up, right. I couldn't play anymore and I couldn't do this or that and stuff like that. And that was all just part of the, uh, the nonsense really yeah. that occurred. Right. I, I was lucky enough to be at your uh, golf tournament and Mark Davis was there and got a chance to talk to him briefly and a uh, great yeah. guy. And I could tell then, you know, just around that room and on stage when you brought everybody up that you guys have a great relationship. So I was, you know, obviously happy to see that. Uh, the five years, I think five to six years that you spent in Kansas City, uh, five. You, you five, you went, you win, like you said, comeback player of the year. Was was that kind of like I told you or, you know, or did you feel um, just rejuvenated going to a different situation? I just feel rejuvenated going to a different situation and somebody who wanted me there, yeah, you know, yeah. um, uh, the late Marty Schottenheimer, um, he, um, he, he called me every single day. He another great, me another great day. coach too, as you know, just, just yeah. to mention another great coach. Yeah. He called me every single day. Uh, he, they started to do things like, uh, Okay, you know what? The AstroTurf, we're going to turn into natural grass, right? We're going to do that. He did a lot of things to get us there, right? And then he made it extremely difficult when he told me they got Joe Montana. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I eventually said, okay, I'm coming to Kansas City. But Byron, it had really nothing to do with the Raiders. Yeah, yeah. It was just trying to find the best situation where I could play, you know? And naturally, I think, you know, we talk about, you know, poetic justice or how, you know, whatever you want to call it. Right. Things just happen to work out. Right. 
uh, we beat them, you know, uh, nine out of 10 times. Wow. Um, um, I scored my 100th touchdown against them. I was the first back in NFL history to gain 2,000 yards, 5,000 receiver. It was against, against them. Wow. But it was the weirdest <laughs> situation because it's like playing against your brother, right, right? Right, And you never want to, you want to win, but you never want to actually either embarrass or make your brothers feel bad. Uh, in the process, you know, and that, but, and so that's, um, it was never about the players though, but it was just the awkwardness of playing against them. Cause I always loved those guys, right? but I was, it was just about, you know, um, winning and, and, and taking care of business really, but it had nothing to do with, I'm going to join the chiefs so I can pay those guys back. Right. Pay back, never an option. It was like, I just need to go someplace where I can play. Right. And, 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 and if I can play, everybody will see, um, you know, that what occurred there was an injustice. That's right. all. Right. Yeah. But it was not my, you know, my ultimate point is like payback. Trust me. I think if you live that way. No. Nah, uh, that, yeah. It, that's not the way to live. Yeah. It's people, something if people that know, you know, that's not that's not how you live anyway. We all know that, no. you know, but people that don't know, I was you might think. To be the best I can be. Yeah. That's you all. know, you just yeah. wanted to go somewhere and play, you know, and that, that was the bottom line. Uh, yeah. Pro, I'm going to ask you this, this question real quick. And um, we, we talked about it a little bit earlier. Uh, I know you've gotten involved with the NFTs and it's called Playbooks. Can you give the folks a little bit, a uh, little bit knowledge of what that's about? Well, it's, it's digital artwork, uh, which is, you know, uh, <laughs> I mean, if, if one can conceive it, <laughs> I guess they can certainly create it. Right. And uh, it is, I guess for the person or the collector that has everything um, or that, you know, has the ability to have everything, you can certainly see where that would be an attractive uh, opportunity for them. But yeah, uh, digital art, um, for example, I mean, I can digitally, you know, recreate my Super Bowl run. Right, right. Uh, narrate it myself. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do. Um, that make that, you know, rather, uh, uh, I guess, a fascinating opportunity and stuff. But um, we'll see where it goes and stuff. But again, I think it's for the person that has everything. Yeah. <laughs> or really, I, I should say that wants everything. That wants know? everything, yeah. Because yeah. we, we, yeah. we, we know how big, you know, trading cards are. You know, all that stuff is just kind of taken off. So this is just another platform for, like you said, especially the people that can really afford it and they want to yeah. be really, uh, they won't really want to go crazy in their memorabilia stuff. Uh, this is a, uh, another great opportunity for them. And I know, as I told you earlier, Kenny Lofton approached me with this as well. So I'm uh, going to be involved in it as well. And we'll, we'll see where it goes. You know, it, sh it should be fun just to, just to see, you know, what the future is. There, probably, you know, a lot of opportunities out there. So, I mean, you know, me, I'm not going to sign a non-disclosure. I mean, uh, or not compete. Right. I'm, right. I'm going to. You can't lock me up. I'm going to like deal with everybody. So. Yeah, as we'll many people as possible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, pro. Possible. Let, yeah. Th this is the last thing I want to ask you. Uh, what is a story that you love to tell people that not a lot of people know about? <laughs> well, <laughs> let me see how to how to say this though, because I mean. When you think about this, uh, Byron, I think it's always interesting to, to sort of to look um, not at, not only at your life, but look at your parents' lives. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. um, because how they are brought up, where they're brought up sort of shapes who they are and stuff like that. So my dad was brought up in Texas, uh, born in 34. And so... Um, you know, you can take the man out of Texas, but you can't take Texas out of him. So my right. dad was the oldest of 11 kids and extremely protective, right? And um, I remember I got into a fight at school, right? And the, the guy that I got into a fight with, fight with was older than me. Mm -hmm. Actually, he went to um, Lincoln High School and I was in junior high school. Um, and so I was actually more concerned about my brother because he was at Lincoln High at the time. Okay. And I remember, I, I don't know if somebody else jumped in, but I, I did what I was supposed to do. And I, um, 
<laughs> handle business. But then somebody said he had a weapon. The right? wait, not you. The other guy had a weapon. Yeah. Okay. Right. And um, I remember, uh, you know, and we heard the expression "fear has a great motivator." Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I remember um, running and then stopping at somebody's house, and it was actually this friend of mine. And then realizing I can't stay there forever, so I have to go home. And um, <laughs> and so I remember crossing this busy street. It was Euclid Avenue. And then when I got near this this gas station and this huge, um, you know, uh, bushes and plants and stuff, uh, there were like three or four guys with these huge boards with nails within them. And they were swinging, they swung at me and I ran across the street, avoiding getting hit by a car. And I must have hurdled this fence that was like, you know, like seven feet tall, <laughs> right? So then I knew I was going to be a pretty good athlete, right? Because there was a great motivator. Right? And, and um, I remember just, uh, you know, going back to my friend's house, calling home, nobody was there. And then, um, there was a neighbor next door that realized what was going home, put me in his car, drove me home. And then this is the, this is the part because I don't want people to, to, um, because when we talk about weapons, right. Mm -hmm. they, you know, it, it, it's not like, you know, we understand these things are prevalent in, in society and unfortunately, you know, but um, at that time, um, I remember um, going home in, in my, my father's closet closet, and getting something out of there. Mm, okay. And, and, um, and sitting on the front porch. Now, I think I was, I had to be like 15 years old or something like that. But you got to understand how I was raised. Um, we were doing things in the neighborhood that most kids didn't do. We were going, we went hunting. Right. We did a lot of things. I mean, I was driving at a very young age. My dad, you know, he, I was 13 and he was, you know, he sat in the passenger seat and I was driving around the, the neighborhood and stuff like that. So, I mean, he just raised us um, as young men early on. And so, and then, as I, I, I would always do, I told my father, well, dad, I'm, I'm probably going to have, you know, I got into a fight. I would always tell him, that's it. And um, I told him what happened. And I, in the process, I broke my, my left hand. Oh, right? wow. I didn't know it at the time, but it was hurting. Right? Okay. So, um, <clears throat> so I go to school the next day. He takes me to school. Right. And then at the end of the, the day, they said, Mr. Allen, uh, I think Marcus is going to have to leave school because I understand we're going to have some problems. There have been some threats of uh, certain people coming up here um, um, and, you know, thinking about retaliation. Right. And uh, so I they take me out of school. I go to the doctor, I get a cast in my hand. And um, eventually, you know, for the next couple of days, I stay home. And then my father said, man, forget this. You're going back to school. So for two weeks straight, Byron, I think the police were outside. There were, you know, uh, gang members outside and stuff like that. For two weeks straight, my dad picked me up, mm. right? Mm. Um, in, his, um, in his pickup truck. And he had something in the back of the pickup truck. <laughs> And that's why I said I'm I'm I'm, I'm, I'm sensitive of, the, of this kind of thing because I don't want people to think that you know this is glorified or anything like that. It's right, not right, right, right. But it but it just showed you. It showed me how my father loved his kids so much he was not going to let anybody. So for two weeks straight, he picked me up, and I would get in the back of the uh, you know the. Um, the truck and we would drive off and he dared anybody. And that, when I look back and reflect, my father was always like that. I remember I got cut. Um, uh, a guy cut me with a knife. Right. And I told my father, well, dad, I'm going to have a fight in the, uh, the next day at school. <laughs> 
<laughs> I was telling See, you, right? I, I, you already know, right? I'm going to have a fight right. tomorrow. <laughs> I'm going to have a fight tomorrow. You said, why? And, um, and I told him, and he says, what? We drove over to that person's house. We didn't wait till the next day. <laughs> we, we drove over to that person's house, right? And I'm sorry I have to talk in code, but that's sort of how it is. But I'm trying to illustrate you, illustrate to you how much my dude, my my our parents loved us, dude. And they realized that they brought us into this uh, world, right? We didn't, we didn't, you know, we didn't ask to come in. So it was up to him to protect us and he was going to do whatever was possible. And, and so that is sort of the story. And you know, that may have been in sport. It, it matter of fact, it was in sports illustrated many, many years ago. Is that right? Yeah. And I'm just going to go ahead and say it now because, you know, so, but there was weapons in the back of the, uh, the, 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 the truck. And I would, I would sit down, I would like sit down in the back of the bank and, you know, the truck and, and, and nobody would think, you know, that this would be coming from me. But <laughs> so I, I have, I have people think, you know, man, I was raised in San Diego, man, right, right. down there, you know, and stuff, but, I in LA. but you know what? People don't know, man, my, my dad is from Texas and my mother's from New Orleans. So I'm from the South. Oh yeah. I got oh, that yeah. all running through me. Right. And so, but my parents, you know, and to this day, I mean, even my dad now, there was like, um, what is he, 87 or 80, getting close to 88 wow. or something like that. Wow. And if I, if I, if I told him, if I told him, you know, that, you know, something's going to happen, he would be, <laughs> he'd, be, he'd, be he'd still be in the truck and it would still be yeah, something in the back. He would be in the truck. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So that's a, uh, and, you know, you try to, you know, because that's something that, you know, I don't, I don't like to talk about that stuff. But it was an, it, it happened. Right. And it right. was, um, you know, part of uh, me growing up and it was, but it was part of the the love that, um, that made me who I am, that, that I, that I feel like is so necessary um, with my child because he didn't ask to come. Right. 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 I mean, I brought my son into this world and now, I mean, I'm, I'm even getting challenged today by whether he will have the freedoms um, that I had, you know, growing up. And I certainly want him to do that. Now, do I do I risk everything for, you know, uh, uh, for him? Yes. 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 It's worth it. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. I mean, everything that my name, my reputation, everything, I don't care. Right. Right. Because it's my responsibility to make sure that my son um, grows up, you know, because we certainly want life to be better for them than we had it. Right. And the direction it's going now, it doesn't look that way. So what do we do? Do we sit on the sidelines? Byron, there's no way. I know there's people out there that are getting paid for propaganda. That'll never be me. Right. I Dude, feel you. You let me tell you what, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to trust in God and stuff, but I'm going to. I'm, I'm going to try to fight for my my family, and and fight for what's necessary, and never ever um, be compromised in any way, um, especially when it comes to you know our freedoms, man. Because, boy, it's 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 kind of scary now to see what's going on. I mean, to, to walk. I mean, I mean, these people are suggesting that you got to have a piece of paper to to validate certain things about you right. and stuff like that. Right. It's crazy. Yeah. I, I, you know what, Pro, you you write in so many ways, and uh, like I said, I know Pops, and, and I see him walk in the room, and he's so cool. But I can see if you mess with your, your if you mess with them boys, he got, they're gonna be some oh. issues. <laughs> oh, <laughs> they're gonna know, be some issues. Here. You know, you know what our number one rule was: if one of our brothers had a fight, we, we all, all have had a fight. <laughs> If we were not, if we were not in it, dude, we were in trouble, man. I remember uh, my brother. Um, we had this long driveway, Byron. We lived in San Diego, man. It was a it was a great neighborhood to, to grow up in. And my dad did things that were like not legal in the, <laughs> not in the sense of like you know codes and things like that. Right. I mean, we actually had horses and. In the in a certain city limits where they weren't supposed to be. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I remember my father. Uh, we uh, we 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 cooked a pig. <laughs> at the house. Near, 
down there, no, down near the sidewalk. We, you know, we, we did everything by it. We were country people. Dude. I know. See, this makes you laugh. Oh, we man. And so we, we, we grew up, Byron, we would, you don't understand this. We would, we would drive, um, uh, my dad would drive on the 405 freeway, right? And, um, or the 94 freeway. And we would be on the back of the, his uh, construction rack, like firemen. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we would hold on the back and our feet would be on the bumper. I mean, we were like, I don't know, 10, 11 years old. Oh, y'all was we crazy. Were, y'all was we crazy. Were crazy. <laughs> no, let Byron, you don't know, we, we used to run across the freeway. Oh yeah, y'all was so, crazy. Y'all was crazy. Yeah, See. On your mark. I guess we were just. It, it was like a race too. You you, you run across for your race and cars we cars coming and that. everything. <laughs> yeah, y'all was crazy, Marcus. Y'all was crazy. I know. So. But listen, my man, I, I love you to death. You you my boy. Let me know when you're coming back in town so we could play some more golf. I'm gonna get my boy Ed on this show too because I would love to hear some of his stories. Oh, ED, he has some good ones. Yeah, Ed being Eric Dick, Eric Dickerson for you folks who don't know who Ed is, but. Um, Pro, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, this is Off the Dribble with Byron Scott. You just had about an hour with my main man, Marcus Allen, <laughs> the All Pro Hall of Famer. Pro, thank you so much. Hey, hey, listen here. First of all, it's a pleasure to be on Off the Dribble, man, especially with you. You're one of my favorite, not only athletes, but favorite people, too, man. Um, I just appreciate you, the person you are, the the father you are, the husband you are, um, the Philip, you know, the, the philanthropist you are. Now, obviously, the uh, the radio host or podcast host, man, is going to be great. Um, anytime you want me, I'm here for you, brother. Okay. Thank you, bro. I appreciate it. You got it, man. That's it, guys. <laughs> bro, thank you, bro. I appreciate it. <laughs> Let me know you're coming back out here because me, me, you. Are. <laughs>